all not having fun or what? Something like that. Uh, <laughs> Woo! You, you know, amending like uh, the rules and changing capitalizations on certain letters. I mean, have you all fired up for liberty right now? <laughs> I know it's the first part of the conventions can get a little arduous and can uh, bring the spirit down because you're here to get something done and it just seems like the rules get all crazy and, and it, uh, it, it can be really frustrating seeing how libertarians, how much libertarians actually care about the rules. <laughs> so uh, today, I'm really pleased to be moderating a panel uh, and I'm pleased with the Texas LP for putting a panel together on police militarization. Uh, reason being that really talking about the drug war is quite easy. We've already won that argument. We know that prohibition doesn't work. Uh, uh, parties across the spectrum, um, you know, organizations, even the, the very ambassadors for the drug war, the people that typically push for prohibition, you know, like the doctors, police officers, professionals, uh, the clergy, the people that were initially pushing for prohibition are now kind of starting to change their tune. And actually in a major way. And my hats are, my hats, completely off of them. It takes a lot of courage to speak up, especially uh, about the, you know, all drugs, like we heard from the candidates last night. You know, the libertarian position is very simple, that government cannot come between, you know, us and substances that we ingest or content that we ingest for our mind. With, with, with prohibitions like that, you know, it's, it's an overly stated argument now. Government has, is omnipotent and you have no moral or ethical premise to uh, limit government, right? So the libertarian position goes far beyond marijuana, but right now the marijuana <laughs> prohibition debate is over. It's just a matter of time before all of our legislatures and then finally the federal government stand down. Just like it happened in the past, it's happening again, and then we'll face the repeal of further prohibitions as the conversation continues. But why I think police militarization is an even more important topic talk about is because I find it noble that the LP wants to stay ahead of the curve in terms of the dialogue. And a lot of um, people are having a very difficult time touching the issue of police abuse, uh, the incremental uh, militarization of all of our police forces from local, state, uh, to the federal level, and what's actually happening in this country and what we can see happening against our brothers and sisters that are being beaten mercilessly for re relatively small crimes, uh, or not even crimes at all, but just suspicions uh, of crime, or just simply by not um, submitting to the arbitrary will of the person with the gun. So if you don't do what the cop tells you, it's gonna escalate so quickly, you're gonna get slammed and executed right there. Um, one of our panelists, uh, I don't wanna you know, uh, spoil anything, but I've heard him say in the past that even militarization of the police force is a misnomer because the military, on a foreign level, gets a heck of a lot more training and rules of engagement uh, than even our, 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 our officers are getting here. Um, it, it just seems like uh, even that may be giving more credit to the situation than, than what's due in terms of uh, on a training level, and I never thought about that before. So while we're, why we are here is to discuss militarization on a multi-dimensional level. Uh, we have the ACLU here, we have Law Enforcement Against Prohibition here, we have Open Carry Texas here, all with their personal stories, incredible stories from the deep inside uh, to the organizers within the government actually executing these things to the victims involved and then also to people that stand up uh, for those that have been victims of, of this militarization. Uh, my name is Justin Armand, I'm the Executive Director of Texas for Accountable Government. We fight on a local and state level um, against this very thing, against police abuse, against, against the very systemic problems that are hitting otherwise probably good people against us. So we try to look beyond uh, just the people uh, with the badge and we look, what are the rules that are creating this behavior that um, have turned our soil to this sort of open uh, battleground? where we don't know just simply by getting a ticket or having a small amount of you know, uh, marijuana on us, is that, is that gonna end our life? We don't know, we don't know how each com confrontation or uh, each engagement with the police, we don't know how it's gonna go anymore. And thank God for social media, we can see just how outrageous it is. And, uh, and it definitely needs to end. 
So let me, um, I'm gonna introduce our panelists and then I'm gonna let them essentially speak for the rest of the panel. They know a lot more than I do, uh, but I'll engage them in conversation and try to you know, bring some questions to the table that kind of come up. And then towards the end of the panel, we'll open it up. So please hold on to your questions and uh, I'm sure the panelists would just you know, be, be happy to, to, uh, to reflect on the things that you bring forward as well. So Russell Jones is from law enforcement against prohibition. Uh, as chronicled in his book, Honorable Intention, Russell Jones has been involved in the, drug, in the war on drugs on various fronts for 40 years. For 10 of these years, Russell worked as a San Jose, California, a police officer, narcotics detective, and member of the DEA-run task force. Later, as a government intelligence agent, Russell worked in Latin America observing narcotics trafficking during the Nicaragua Contra conflict. Uh, in, academia, in academia, he uh, conducted studies of the impact of drug abuse on the crime index, wrote training programs for identifying the psychological and physiological symptoms of narcotic use, and developed rehabilitation programs designed specifically for uh, the court mandated clients. Um, he traveled throughout the former Soviet Union and China to study their drug problems and policies in the field of drug rehabilitation. Uh, uh, Russell implemented and taught courses of various, uh, uh, for various California and Texas counties. We also have C.J. Grisham. Uh, many of you all know C.J. because he's a, he's a Texan here. Uh, he's been a victim of a horrible police encounter because the officer simply didn't know the law. Uh, when he, he'll go into his story and what happened, um, but he came forward and he turned something that was awful that happened to him into uh, an incredible movement. I also, you know, have fought beside CJ at the legislature. He has, you know, he, he's very issue specific and PAG is very broad, but what he cares about, PAG cares about, and he's an honorable man. He really fights to advance liberty uh, and constitutional carry here in Texas. Um, and then uh, Joe Swanson uh, from the ACLU, he came here um, to kind of have that additional perspective the ACLU has been, the ACLU is an incredible ally of Texas for accountable government. I mean, they have been fighting against civil asset forfeitures in the surveillance state. Uh, a lot of their issues converge with liberty, and uh, I just, it's really great having uh, Joe here as well. So let's go ahead and start. Um, uh, go ahead and make your introduction, uh, Russell. I'd like you to just kind of open up the floor, whatever comes to mind. All right, we turned on. Yes, we are. Uh, my name is Russell Jones. Uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today. I represent Law Enforcement Against Prohibition. We are an international uh, organization of current and nonprofit members of law enforcement. So we're judges, prosecutors, chiefs of police, sheriffs, police officers, narcotics detectives, and DEA agents. All of us believe that the war on drugs, as it is currently being fought, is a failed policy, and that there's a much better way to go about it. And that's something uh, hopefully we can talk about today. As I said, I'm CJ Grisham. Um, so I, I'm one of those guys that I was raised that when a police officer walks up to you, you say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, that you give absolute and utter respect to law enforcement. And that's pretty much what I did my entire life. Um, you, you know, I used to be one of those people that when I saw a video on YouTube, uh, I was the guy going, well, he probably deserved it. You know, we don't know what happened before that video turned on. We don't know uh, what did he do to, to, to have that happen. And uh, so here's a guy, me, that uh, has never been in trouble in his entire life. I, I have top secret security clearance in the military. And um, I also worked counter narcotics in South America. Uh, back when I first joined the Army, and I got very disillusioned with it and changed professions. Um, but I ended up on the wrong end of a bad attitude, is basically what happened. And I found out very quickly that when you see something on a YouTube channel, my first inclination is no longer, what did the guy do to deserve that treatment, but what is wrong with that police officer? And because I've now, I now have the distinction of having two arrests for never committing a crime and three threats for an arrest because I refuse to back down. Um, the most recent yesterday, which I'll probably talk about here in a few minutes. 
uh, almost got arrested. So what I have learned now is a police officer now must earn my respect. And I have recognized that we, the people, need to reassert our power. And we need to bring our law enforcement back into check because as I told those officers yesterday, they sit there and they complain that it's only a small minority or a small fraction of these police officers that are making them all look bad. And yet eight of them stood around watching as my rights were violated. So who really is the minority? Do they have 8,000 cops in that district? And then I just happen to get all eight of the bad ones. So uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that a little bit later, but uh, this is something that's personally affected me. It's, it's completely changed my worldview. And I, I am no longer what I call a copologist. I will not apologize for the actions of the police anymore because I'm a personal victim of it. Did you trademark that term right there? Copologist? I should. Hi, uh, my name is Joe Swanson. Um, thank you so much for having me. This is so oh, exciting. Um, so I'm a community organizer uh, in the DFW area, uh, North Texas region, generally speaking, including East Texas too, which is just so notable for all y'all that are from there. Um, and what I do basically is I use community power to advocate um, for the positions that the ACLU would have, right? In the ACLU of Texas, what we do in Texas is um, protect and uh, advance the civil liberties and human rights uh, that are given to us uh, in the Constitution, right? And given the fact that the Constitution uh, sets up barriers um, for state actors, naturally because police are state actors, we have a heavy interest in making sure that we protect um, uh, we the people's rights um, from those state actors when they do cross that bound, right? That bound that the Constitution creates. Um, so, uh, do you mind if I just kind of go into what I'm going to do? Whatever you're feeling. All right, cool. Um, so, uh, about two years ago, the ACLU National uh, did a report on police militarization, um, given the uptick in how it's kind of uh, started to gain some traction uh, throughout the country as a, as a hot topic issue, as well as the fact that these are police, um, these people have guns, that's a serious thing, they patrol our neighborhoods. Um, so, from this report, um, we were able to say, you know, uh, we feel that this is true, but this is substantiated by the fact that, you know, 63 agencies responded to our requests for information. Um, and from those requests, we found that those 63 agencies that responded, we found that 15,054 items of battle uniforms and personal protection equipment were owned by those only 63 agencies. Again, that's fit over 15,000 battle grade uniforms. Meanwhile, uh, we also see that there's an estimated of, of about 500 um, local enforcement agencies that received RAPs, uh, which are mine resistant ambush protected vehicles, right? Um, that are going into neighborhoods and ready to take on uh, uh, an Iraq war situation, right? Um, and this is, a lot of this is coming from uh, the DOD or, or the Department of uh, Defense's uh, 1033 program. So from all this, we know that militarization has occurred among the police uh, with almost no public oversight. Um, uh, and SWAT often deployed uh, for warrants rather than hostage situations uh, or barricaded shooters, right? Um, now on top of that, this is disproportionately impacting communities of color. Um, so I, as an organizer in the DFW area, I looked at Fort Worth PD, uh, which sent in a lot of information to us when we requested it to kind of get an idea of, okay, what's happening on the local level so I can kind of get, you know, um, an idea of like um, its own kind of case on, at the grassroots level. Um, we received 70 incident reports in one year, so that's about one SWAT deployment every five days, about. Um, again, we think about SWAT as, you know, these, it's a, almost essentially a paramilitary unit. Um, and when we think about SWAT, we think about barricaded student shooters, hostage situations, things like that, right? This is the kind of thing that you would imagine this kind of military grade 20-man team battering ram operation would come in, where they do throw, they th they'll do things like throw in, uh, flashbang grenades, they shoot dogs, they always shoot the dog because they don't trust owners to maintain control of the dog, whether it's a chihuahua or a rottweiler, right? So you come home to this situation and you hope that this was somebody's life was saved, 
right? Because there was somebody who was walled up in there with an assault rifle. Um, but as it turns out, in Fort Worth, Texas, 97% of those SWAT deployments were only for an arrest warrant or a drug search. Only 3% of those, of those incidents of SWAT deployments were actually for what you might expect, like a barricaded shooter or something like that. Um, so almost 80% of those were also serving no-knock warrants, right? So usually, um, if you're dealing with a police officer, if there's a warrant, you'll hear a knock on the door, and there's a certain amount of time that they'll say, you know, we, we, can, res we can knock on the door if we don't have any response within like a reasonable amount of time. Something along those lines, right? Um, but these are no-knock warrants, so you can just be sitting there, hanging out in your living room, and all of a sudden your door comes down, there's a flashbang grenade, and then there's 20 guys running in full body armor ready to attack you, right? Um, and uh, when we look at why, we ask the question, okay, if there's 97% of these that are for arrest warrants and drug searches, what do they write down to say, this is the reason we're sending a SWAT team as opposed to a, like a friendly neighborhood police officer? And we found that about 30% of the time, there was no affidavit saying, we're, this is why we're sending a SWAT team, right? So we can't even really, for sure, answer the question as to why they're sending a SWAT team instead of a normal police officer, because there's no policy in Fort Worth to say that, you know, if you're going to send a SWAT team, you have to sign this affidavit saying that we expect this in the house, this is the reason we're really afraid for the lives of our um, officers, because this person in the house has some record of violence or something like that, right? Um, and on top of that, um, so we have 30% where they don't even list the reason why they sent the SWAT team. Then we have 70% where they do. Of that 70%, they'll say, usually, we, we expect a gun to be in the house, right? Um, of that time, 40% of the time that they walk away, they walk away without finding any weapons. So they're just saying, you know, we expect a gun to be in the house, and that's reason enough to send it in a paramilitary unit. And again, like, if we're going to use you know, there's potentially going to be a gun in the house, and that's enough grounds to send in a SWAT team. I'm, I'm sitting right here next to Open Carry, Texas. I mean, this is Texas, y'all. I mean, this is, it's not like there's not a lot bunch of guns in a bunch of people's houses, you know? Uh, so the question then comes to, okay, so who is this affecting, right? If we can't answer why they're sending the SWAT team, can we at least know who these people are that they're hitting? It turns out that this is a racial issue in that if you are black, you are over 18 times more likely to be affected by a SWAT raid in Fort Worth, Texas than if you're white. There's also disparity for if you're Latino as well. So it almost sounds like, okay, so if there's an arrest warrant or we suspect drugs in the house in this side of town where the black people live, we're gonna send a SWAT team. But if it's in this side of town where the white people live, you know, we'll just have somebody come knock on the door and be like, hello, how are you doing, sir? We just wanted to talk to you a little bit, you know? So um, what we're doing as an organization, like I said, my role is a community organizer. Um, so I have to find the impact of community and see if this is an issue that folks care about. The problem is, is that when it comes to police interactions um, with folks, police militarization is not the, the sexiest issue. Right, because while there's 70 incident reports here, that is pales in comparison in comparison to, to racial profiling reports. Right, so in talking about the police, I understand the impact that has on my liberty that somebody can go knock down my door and say, you know, we suspect there might be a gun in the house just because, right, without any evidence of me having any violent history or anything like that. Um, but this is not an issue that's necessarily taken as, you know, this is something that we need to solve on the grassroots level. Um, I find that to be a problem because I see intersectionality between those two issues, um, um, general police oversight as well as, you know, police militarization. Um, but hopefully that gives you a little bit of a glance of what's happening actually at the local level beyond just, you know, knowing that the federal government is in using our local police departments um, with a whole lot of military grade style weapons and armament to defeat, you know, the guy who went and stole a candy bar at the, at the local drugstore. Thank you, Jeff. So I'd like to turn this actually back over to Russell. And uh, we, we mentioned that it doesn't seem like a, a war was ever absolutely declared on us. Uh, it doesn't seem like uh, militarization was ever a program that was directly uh, created through, you know, legislation and through policy or even executive orders. It seems to me that the incremental militarization of law enforcement was a result of really bad domestic policies. 
and I know you've done a lot of work uh, on the drug wars, but maybe you could speak to um, how prohibition has you know, been a catalyst for this. Well, it's certainly been a catalyst. When we talk about militarization or loss of our rights or excessive uh, police, uh, civil asset forfeiture, you know, we could spend an hour on that, police corruption, reduced clearance, rape, the violent crime, untested rape kits, and all these are topics that we can go on. We could have a whole seminar on just these topics. Prison overcrowding, uh, the international uh, crisis of cartels. Uh, we could, you could almost make a tree out of it and all these different branches of all these different problems uh, that we're having today. And, it, and you're right, it's, it's a slow increment, incrementalization that has occurred since 1969 when Nixon declared the war on drugs. And the root of this tree, though, from my point of view, is the war on drugs. And again, the war on drugs, you can't have a war on an inanimate object, but what you really have is a war on people. And, uh, and I, what was interesting about my point of view and my perspective is that I was involved in law enforcement at the very beginning of the war on drugs. I began law enforcement in the late 60s, early 70s, President Nixon uh, was elected, came into office in 70, and he was the one who coined the phrase, the war on drugs. And so I saw, I saw what was going on in society, what our problems were. We didn't have drug cartels. We didn't even have street gangs in 1970. But slowly, as this war uh, continued, as they needed more money, they needed more personnel, as the efforts were stepped up, we began to lose more and more life. Police began to take more and more of the militarization uh, attitude toward the problem. And that's where we're at today. So how has the LP, where many of us are delegates, some of us are just attending the convention, uh, who enjoy you know, all the speakers that are here, what can we as Texans do? We have a legislative session approaching. There's many things we can do on the local level uh, like the ACLU was kind of talking about with just even making require, having reporting requirements or affidavit requirements for these SWAT teams. What do you want to leave us with? What message do you want to leave us with here on how we can, uh, to invoke a military turn, how, how we can combat this ourselves and respond to this? Obviously, we take arms against the police right now. We're going to have a really serious situation. It doesn't seem like we've completely resorted to that, but it looks like things are heating up. And it looks like people so what would you like to leave a message to, specifically the LP, and what we can do against the counter militarization? Well, again, I'm coming from the point of view that the war on drugs is the failed policy and it's the root of all these problems. But what I want to leave you with is you need to become informed, not just with the anecdotal story, but you need to become informed of the facts and the evidence. Uh, and, and join organizations, and I can do a little promoting right now, join organizations like LEAP, and I actually do that today. But get on our website, learn what we're about. From there, you can get the facts. Okay? There's a great website, by the way, called Drug Book Facts, which will give you a lot of facts, not only about the drugs, but about the, the war on drugs and uh, incarceration and, and our loss of our First Amendment rights, so on and so on. So I, I want you to know the facts. Make sure you know where you're coming from when you start to make the arguments. Because if it's just, if it's just rhetoric, if it's just anecdotal stories, we're not going to get anywhere. What would you say to fellow officers that are currently enforcing these zombie policies? Well, yeah, it's tough when you're talking to law enforcement because their job is to enforce the laws as they are written. So it's difficult. Uh, but that does not mean, though, that they can't be uh, open-minded, they can't uh, take discretion, and they need to remember the Constitution. But uh, I, I, I have a hard time in my arguments, and I make a lot of presentations to active law enforcement, but it's much easier to make the argument with, with law enforcement uh, retiring, uh, because they're able to step back now. You know, the old phrase, you can't see the forest for the trees, they're able to step back and see the problem uh, from a little bit different point of view than when you're inside of it. This is it. So I, I think Part of the problem, and I'm gonna um, kind of fishtail off what Joe said where he's talking about uh, there might be a, a gun in the home. So my first arrest, I was lawfully carrying a, a rifle while hiking with my son out in the country near where I live. Um, 
a police officer thought he had the right, the authority, the duty to grab my firearm and try to extract it from me without a fight. Uh, apparently, I was the first person that's ever stood up to this guy because I ended up with a gun to my head thrown under the hood of a police car. So for the first time in my life, what started out as a very cordial interaction, because like I said, I, I was raised to respect law enforcement. The first thing I said when he got out of the car was, how you doing today? And his first re response was, fine, don't be touching it. I said, excuse me? He said, don't be touching it. And I looked down, okay? And from that moment on, I could tell that this wasn't gonna go the way I thought it was, but I never knew it was gonna end up the way it did. And what I found out is when my video came out, um, which we released only because law enforcement was lying to the press about what happened that day. And what happened was, as they, as they would tell the press something, I would release a little snippet of my video. And then they would go and tell something else to try and cover that up. And so I released another snippet of my video to keep proving them wrong. And I did this three times. I released three 30-second videos. Then my attorney uh, contacted me and says, hey, CJ, they just filed a motion to suppress your uh, or, I'm sorry, to, to put a gag order on your video. And I said, oh, really? So I put it up on YouTube, the entire thing. I went to every pro-gun and pro-liberty site I could find. I begged them to download this video, put it up wherever they want to put it up, share it anywhere they can share it, put it all over the place because the police are trying to hide what they've done to me. And that wasn't bad enough. What was really bad is how many of my own friends turned on me because I dared to not bend over and kiss the ass of my oppressor. The fact that I stood up to that police officer turned so many of my friends who I call patriots against me. That's when I realized the problem is not necessarily the police, although it is, it's the people. Here in San Antonio, um, just this last week, uh, I don't know if you saw, but there's a, a viral video that just came out of a San Antonio ISD school resource officer body slamming a 90 pound sixth grade little girl face first onto the concrete. He had her contained, holding her. This was a 100, probably 80, 70 pound man. And he decided he was gonna do a backflip world WrestleMania a body slam of this little girl onto the concrete, and people think that's okay. The response is, well, that's what she gets for not complying. That's the problem we have. And what we hear is, well, law enforcement are under attack. Law enforcement are being murdered. Can you go to the next slide for me? This is 2015. In 2015, 42 fatalities of law enforcement officers. 42, down, was it 14%? 14% uh, drop from the previous year, and it's been dropping. The number of law enforcement that are getting killed uh, feloniously is dropping, while the number of law enforcement officers being killed by stepping into traffic is rising. That's the major cause of the deaths of law enforcement. But we're supposed to believe that because 42 people were feloniously killed in one way or another, that we're supposed to give up our rights and accept the fact that we can have our rights trampled on, that cops can do whatever they want to, that we should just sit by and accept it. So 42 law enforcement. Now, if you'll just slowly about one second apiece, just go through the next five slides for me. just January through March of last year. Now, granted, some of those guys were thugs. I get that. Um, and, you know, if, if you uh, point a gun at me, I'm going to shoot you also. So I'm not saying that cops shouldn't be killing people. Some people need to be killed because they're violent and they're being violent. And the only way to stop violence is with violence, and that should be the only time violence is used. But to justify the killing of 1,206 Americans because 42 cops are killed is kind of disgusting in my view. And one more slide if you can. This is my police department up in Temple, Texas back in 1950 and my police department today. 
Temple, Texas, home of about 66,000 people, small little town. Why do we have the same vehicles I had in Afghanistan and Iraq? Actually, I take it back. When I was in Iraq, we didn't have those vehicles, unless you were on a tank. So, and, and oh, oh, they also have, put one more, I forgot, they, they also have a pony. So, that's important. So, and then, so really quick, I don't want to take up too much time, so I'll just go one more. So I'll, here, I'll follow you guys. Okay, so, here's my personal experiences. So I talked about the arrest in 2013, which we're still fighting to this day, three hours, and a, or three years and a month later. Um, but if you look down below that, that's at the Austin Capitol. And I know I'm a gun rights guy, but I believe in civil rights. And what I was at the Capitol with, I was with a bunch of veterans on Veterans Day, and we were protesting the way that gun rights activists were being treated by the Capitol Police and by others. So we were exercising our First Amendment right to protest in the very place where that right should be most protected. The troopers did not like me being up there. They told us we had to leave. I told them we don't have to leave. They said, if you don't leave, we're gonna charge you with criminal trespassing. I told them I had a toy gun, it wasn't a real gun. And again, I asked them, what is your authority to tell me to leave? And they arrested me. Arrested me for criminal trespassing for doing absolutely nothing against the law. Now that charge was thrown out after a year of going to court, every single month. And then the last one up there, if you look, that's a, the McLennan County Courthouse um, in, a, in a strange twist of irony here, a storm came through and ripped off the left arm of Lady Justice up there. So there's no scales on her arm in McLennan County. And that's kind of a uh, foreboding tale because yesterday I went to McLennan County Courthouse um, because I was gonna protest the McLennan County Courthouse or court decision to ban guns against state law. And I left my gun in the car. I wasn't going to engage in that fight, but I had a pocket knife on me, which is also perfectly legal, and, and they're not allowed to ban that. I was threatened with arrest because I refused to leave. They had eight officers around there that, that needed to control little old five foot five me um, because I refused to leave where I had a right to be. So hey, these are the problems that we have. Don't pretend like you're not a badass. Everybody <laughs> knows you're a badass. Too. So, um, but, but, but the problem is, is that nobody does anything. There was a, a, a lawyer that came by and I called these guys, um, I, I called them status asshats, right? <laughs> and as I said that, this gentleman walks in and he says, I demand, I am offended by that language, I demand you charge him with disorderly conduct. And I said, I, I think that tie is offensive and you should arrest him for disorderly conduct because that is an ugly tie. And that's just, that's, it's the citizenry's problem. And until the people, and unfortunately, the only time people are gonna turn like I did is when it affects them. Right. Joe, uh, one thing that I think the ACLU can bring to the table here as part of this conversation is our organization will fight policy and law First causes and kind of see how those causes have created these unintended consequences of militarization. However, if you speak with that tone to black people and minorities, people the ones that are being beaten and, and lives are ending every single day simply just because they're black, they'll respond to me that, wow, that's your white privilege, which, which gives you the, the, uh, the ability to even talk in those terms. I've had people call me out and call my organization out, and it does seem that a lot of activists at these events, it's a lot of it's a lot of white people at these events. So I feel like there's a division, and there's a division in our community on how to address this problem. The problem I have is how do we fight racism, right? So the the, pro the problem of bigotry and racism with police officers, it's it's very difficult. It seems like, and on an institutional legal level, is when racism has been the worst. And when you have just idiots that are racist, it seems relatively benign to, to disassociate yourself from them. However, how do we reach the minorities, the black uh, uh, communities that are being harmed the most by these policies, speak their language, bring them together, and unify so that we can create change together, rather than kind of you know, seeming like we have our own fight, the, the white fight and then the black minority fight. Can you address like the social justice so-called issue that the ACLU takes very seriously? Yeah. Um 
So I, I think first it's hard for me to answer that question because I, I am very white, like very, very white myself. Um, so it's hard for me to operate as a mouthpiece um, for uh, black, a black movement, right? Um, so I, I mean, one thing, one thing we know for sure is that it doesn't matter if you're white. What matters is if you have the power to create change, right? Um, I mean, it, it's very obvious to everyone that uh, the war on drugs has oppressed a huge, huge swath of our country, right? Um, and we can go to think tanks and produce these white papers that point by point just kind of tears apart the war on drugs. Um, but until you have the power to change those policies, you are only just right. And that, that doesn't necessarily change the lives of any Americans. Um, I, okay, this is a tough question. Well, we, don't, we don't have to go there, and you're right. I just, I, I, the ACLU does draw a lot of people, essentially from the left, and more of the kind of, they, I like working with the ACLU because it, ACLU because it, it adds more diversity to the conversation. And, uh, and I just thought maybe we could touch on that. If, if, if we can, it's just something that I've been wondering and I really take it seriously when people sort of attack us for fighting on a systemic level because they say, hey, it was racism that created gun prohibition. It was racism that created drug prohibition to get the so-called undesirables off the, street, off the street to push the minority out of, minorities out of our communities and into cages. So how, it was just a, a something that I thought of and it seems like maybe yeah. You know, we try to do this with Open Carry Texas. There's a place in uh, Houston called Fifth Ward. It's a very minority rich. Uh, it's got a lot of history of segregationalism and things like that. And we, we got a lot of criticism for being a white male organization, and we're not. We're Everybody's welcome. I don't care if you're Muslim, Christian, atheist, male, female, black, blue, whatever. Um, so we went down to Fifth Ward because we wanted to encourage the minority community to stand up and exercise their rights. Because the only way that we're gonna get past this idea that if you see a black person or a minority with a gun, um, the only way we're gonna get past that is by doing it. That's what we did with our rifles. We, we carried them until we forced people to accept the fact, uh, to accept the fact that we're not hurting anybody. So we tried to get a minority community. The problem was they tried to portray it as the white man coming into a black neighborhood to march through our neighborhood, when really we wanted to march with the neighborhood. So there's barriers that need to be brought down on on both sides. And granted, there was an instigator. I mean, Juan uh, right. LX is uh, a racist. But, anyway, but we need we do we we need to keep reaching out um, on both sides and and try to incorporate more of these minorities into the liberty movement. And if I can use my white privilege, whatever that is, to help others to carry with me, just to get them started. I'm, I'm willing to do that, and I, I wish they would do it because they're afraid. The minority community is afraid to open carry. The minority community is afraid to exercise their Second Amendment rights, and they have a legitimate right to that fear. That's probably a legitimate reason to that fear. Um, actually, okay, let's let's start from the let's start from you, and then work through the panel because we're uh, starting to wrap. So we we talk, we said let's let's do uh, two minutes right now. Um, what what do you want to see from the LP? What do you want to see here? What what kind of work, very specifically, do you want to see from Texas uh, liberty activists in general, from all these organizations, on how we can demilitarize the police and, and do it in a way that's really effective and hit that, that first cause, but that's also realistic and pragmatic. Um, so maybe you can leave us with your work, and then please, everybody here, Write your notes. I'm sure you're already on the same page, but there's a whole lot here that you can work with leading up to the session. So let's let's look at the takeaway right now. Yeah. Um, so I would say um, uh, to uh, go off of what you just said, sir, um, uh, recognize where your allies are, um, because disproportionate use of force is impacting many many communities who tend to be minority, either in thought or race or whatever. Um, uh, and I would also go as far as to say too that um, the, the trouble with, with marginalized communities is they do not have the voice to advocate for themselves, right? They do not have the power to advocate for themselves. 
um, and, and you, I like what you said then, when you said, um, if I have um, the white privilege to use, I want to use it to leverage for others, right? And I think that's amazing. I think that in the end, that's what the, the answer is, is, how do I use our my privilege to ask the question, What? tell me what to do. Tell me what you need from me so I can help you, you be liberated. Because in the end, our liberation is tied together. Uh, what I think the LP party needs to do, and I think what all of us need to do is, look, I'm, I'm very angry at law enforcement in general. My son, who was there when I got arrested, does not like or trust cops. He literally has a, a meltdown whenever he sees one walking towards him. That's how it affected him, seeing a gun stuck to his dad's head. But that said, when I created Open Carry Texas, part of our mission statement is to work with law enforcement to minimize those kinds of encounters. So what we need to do as a party, what we need to do as activists, is first try to work with them. I know that that's, you gotta hold your nose, You've got to you know, probably plug them up there a little bit, but we've got to try to work with law enforcement and get them on our side. To the extent that they don't, you know, I tell law enforcement, I will work with you to the extent that you try to infringe upon my rights, and then I'm very belligerent. But, but I'm your best friend, and, and that's what we got to do. We've got to make sure we're not pushing them away while we're criticizing them. I put up that video of that little girl yesterday, and all I did was I said, why are we allowing this in Texas? Even if she had kicked, the cop in the shin. Why are we allowing a cop to body slam a 90 pound little girl, sixth grade? And uh, and just asking that question, uh, I, I just I got mercilessly attacked. But I don't care. We need to ask those questions. But we also we need to while we're criticizing, we also need to praise the good guys and encourage them to stand up and rat out the bad guys, the 80 percent. As representative. Of I guess I would want the Libertarian Party to uh, have on their platform that the Warren Rose Hotel policy that has led to a numerous number of social injustices. And I would ask you, again, I'm repeating myself, to become involved with Lee, uh, learn about Lee, learn about the Warren Rose, know the facts and the evidence. And uh, you can do that again before you leave. Please sign up for Lee, take one of my cards, get a hold of me, want to discuss further. If you've got groups that you would like me to come talk to, I'd be happy to. Uh, again, get involved with another pack and evidence. And thank you again. So there's there's also a cultural side of this, which we can change the culture. And I see this happening with Cop Walk, with uh, We Cop Watch, with Peaceful Streets Project. I've done it myself, and I try to get out into the community as much as I possibly can. But I'm not nearly as dedicated as some of these Cop Watchers that I sit back and I have a deep amount of respect for, whether we disagree and when you when when you're out there and you're filming the police in a group you change the culture you, you get you, you get them talking about uh, you and in a really bad way and hating you but they're on their best behavior and you can save lives in ways that you can't otherwise and I've been there I, I, I've seen what happens especially in the middle of Austin uh, when people start getting drunk and how the cops just you know, They'll slam somebody down and pound them, um, and it, it's 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 pretty scary. Also, when you see how hostile cops get towards you while you're filming. But uh, in terms of not necessarily just being a part of the the cop uh, uh, watching or the you know these organizations that are around, when you see somebody being engaged by the police while you're driving home, especially when you have people that you love with you. Instead of driving by and going, oh, poor soul, why don't you pull over and get your you know, cell phone out and have a procedure, even with your family and friends, that you film the police officer from a safe distance, even take a, a small training on how to do it, and then have somebody film you to make sure you're protected as well. I always try, and I don't do this every time, nobody does it every time, unless you're likely to sink, um, to stop. I try to show my, my children that when we see somebody being pulled over, even in a casual stop, that you stop and you do your duty to film because you never know what's going to happen. It's, 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 it's that you know, very small chance that somebody happened to be there when, when, a, when a cop said you spit in their face when you actually didn't. That could save you from years of prison and a lifetime of ruin simply because you know, somebody wasn't there filming. So please, save a life just like it's important to do jury duty and, and be 
he not, you know, vote, I mean, uh, 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 give a not guilty verdict if you don't see an actual victim and change somebody's life, it's very important to film the police every chance you can get and empower yourself. And the CJ um, has come to uh, sort of embody in his life is to learn how to talk back to the police because it's very, very nerve wracking standing your ground with the cops. You see people do it on, on videos, you think you can do it until you're in that situation. Talk back, when you're getting a speeding ticket, talk back, break that culture of submission. Obviously you wanna give humans a, a, a considerable amount of respect, but at the same time, they have to earn your respect. And when they're in a position of authority, they're at a much higher level of respect that they need to rise up to. So work on talking back, and especially do it uh, uh, for your children so, so they see that they don't have to be cat on it to be sheep and they don't have to bow down to these people, right? So um, yes, we see these three gentlemen. It's not it's not totally uh, normal for a moderator to speak uh, like affirmatively, but uh, I'm very passionate about this issue too, and, and I, I'm just so grateful that you all are here and that uh, the LP will host a, a panel like this. So let's give a round of applause for our panel. Thank you.